Good morning, church. It's great to see everybody this morning. Would you all please stand as we begin worship, singing this morning, I Believe. opportunity I need to share with you. In our policies and procedures manual for Next Gen Ministries, it states that we will have two adults in every classroom with programming for our kids. 
This is to protect both our kids and our adults. We currently have four classrooms with dedicated teachers who prepare to lead their part of our ministry each week, but they don't have a second adult. We have three on the preschool floor and one on our kids' floor. We would love to have somebody who can be there each week, but we understand schedules and travel. If you could adopt one Sunday a month, that would be great. We have several that already do. If your Sunday school class would like to adopt another class, we would love to have you come serve with us. We have classrooms where you can sit to help, and we love having every generation sprinkle their wisdom and love on our kiddos. Our children's ministry is a hopping place. We have lots of families who are joining us for both Sunday school and in service. FBC has a great legacy of teachers who have shepherded both your families and you. Now we need you to come serve with us for the new generation who is joining our fellowship. We can't wait to serve with you. It's a message for us. It's a uh, literally a growing problem that we have over in our children in preschool. You know, like a growing problem, you know, we have a lot of expansion of our kids. We got a lot of folks that are coming. Hey, we do need some folks that would be willing to jump in and help out. And some of you right now know that I've been looking for a place of service. I've been looking for a place to get plugged in and helping in our preschool and helping in our children's ministry might be that location for you. Just so you know, if you do volunteer, you touch base with Leanne. She does, we do a background check on everyone that works with our children, uh, preschool children, as well as our youth as well. And so just want you to know that that is coming up. Hey, I'm Tim. I'm glad you're here in our time of worship. I do want to give you a couple other things. Lee, give us a big wave. Lee has a couple big things planned this afternoon. Our students are got uh, activities over at uh, the Bettis house. If you're one of the uh, ladies that are involved in our student ministry, they're going to have a special tea and they get to wear, you know, have their little pinky up. Is that right? And they're going to have a special tea that's going to happen for our ladies in our youth group. And then in the evening time and the uh, dinner time over at the Goad house, the boys are going to have a beast feast and they're going to grill and, and uh, going to, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know what they're going to eat, you, you know, but it's going to be meat. I, I'm sure that's going to happen. But our student ministry is going and he's got lots of great things that are planned, a lot of activities that are happening. Hey, I want you to know about Rodney, what he's got planned coming up after Labor Day. The uh, Wednesday after Labor Day is the nine, uh, se- it's the uh, seventh uh, day of the month. I kind of got it right this time, you know, at Wednesday night um, f- at six o'clock, we're going to start having a new study in our fellowship hall, and it's going to be on the book of James. And you want to get a part of that and want to join in? If you're not able to participate on a regular basis, we now are going to be able to stream the Wednesday night study that's going to take place. We've got the equipment now in, 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 along those lines. Some of you, because of your travel, you can't make it and you want to be there. There's a lot of you that will participate in the study and then re-watch it later to be able to kind of catch up with some notes because there's just such a great uh, study. And going through the book of James is going to be a, one of those wonderful times. And then the Sunday after Labor Day, that's on the, uh, the 11th at 5 o'clock, Rodney's going to do a new study starting through the fall semester in our chapel. And that's at 5 o'clock, and it's on Paul's theology. And love for you to be a part of that and, and uh, take place in, in what he's going to take us and teach us as we look at Paul's theology throughout the New Testament. So we just wanted to give you a couple quick updates. I was reminded this past week about the re- uniqueness of what we do on a real regular basis every Sunday. I don't know if you recognize that right now, all around the world, there have been Christians that are gathering on Sunday to worship Jesus. Different time zones, different ethnic, different cultures. You know, go with me on that. You know, they gather just like us. And so I want to take just a moment of pause, let the music just play, and ask that you'd bow your head. And you would allow the Lord to center, center your mind and your thoughts. What does He want to tell you today? What are you bringing to Him?
Father, it is humbling to recognize that there are people all around this world who know you, who love you, who worship you. Father, we come today as a community, a congregation. We want to hear a word from you. Because, Father, we are here for you. So as we have the opportunity to use the different elements of this worship service, through the music, through the proclaimed word, would you just speak to our hearts and our minds and our souls? We pray this name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you all please stand as we continue worship?
to turn our eyes on you alone as we've just sung lord may this song be our prayer may it be our plea that everything fades away in this world lord 
and our focus is truly on you. It's easy to get sidetracked. It's easy to be surrounded by the world and fall into it, Lord. May we cling to you, Lord. May we put on Christ to face the days, to face challenges that we have, Lord. I thank you for your son. I thank you for his death, his, for the forgiveness of our sins and his resurrection, Lord. Our only hope and our savior in this world. Lord, at this time, I lift up Rodney to you, Lord, as he, as he brings the word. Lord, may the scripture pierce our hearts this morning, Lord. May we learn something fresh, something new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Thanks, Cole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cole, and to the praise team for leading us in worship. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Please take your Bibles from to Acts chapter 19. We live in a fearful world. In the literal sense of the word, uh, we seem to be full of fear. Everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, it seems that we're so anxious about a variety of things that could go wrong. Many of us tend to live in, in a constant state of paralysis, um, knowing that as risky as the world could be, horrible things can happen. And to make matters worse, not only can you conjure up in your own mind enough fear on your own, all it takes is a little while spending some time on whatever social medium you choose. <laughs> and there's story after story about a horrible thing that happened and you look and go, oh my goodness, I had no idea that could happen. And now the fear grows and grows. When I returned to the classroom years ago in the year 2000, at that time at the Baptist University where I taught a little college in Missouri, we had uh, in the psychology faculty, we had one faculty member who was uh, half time devoted to counseling. When I left uh, 19 years later, they had three full time counselors and they needed to hire one, maybe even two more. There are so many people that are crippled by anxiety. And it, it kind of dawns on us, doesn't it, that if God is a good God and he's created a good, good world, why would I live in fear? Why, why would I think that you know, I'm, I should live in that fear of the other shoe dropping? And there's so many things to be afraid of, fear of failure, fear of the unknown, fear of future, fear of sickness, and, and yet we are supposed to be a people who are not fearful but faithful, a lesson that the Ephesian Christians learned 2,000 years ago. They discovered that being full of fear is mutually exclusive to being full of faith. I'll say that again. Being full of fear is mutually exclusive to being full of faith. We've been looking at pivotal moments in the life of the early church and seeing how the good news that was preached by Peter and Paul overcomes all the barriers that tend to divide us. Social, economic, political, religious, racial, all the barriers and it seems like in this story of Acts chapter 19, all of these barriers show up all at once. And indeed how the gospel came in like a little leaven that leavened the whole lump of Ephesus. And the dramatic change began to happen among the Ephesian believers, deciding they were going to turn their back on fear and live in full faith is indeed not only a dramatic story for us to consider 2,000 years later, but we identify with them. I mean, you would think with all our advances in medicine, all the things that we do to insulate ourselves and protect ourselves and security systems, you would think we would have such an advantage. There would be very little to fear, but it seems like it only gets worse. Some things never change. So I'm going to look at Acts chapter 19, the story that's read there. And I want to start with the end first. I want to read the story backwards. Because I think when, if we read it backwards, starting with the end, we'll see how, indeed, the drama unfolded 
and how we might identify with these Ephesians uh, and rediscover what it means to be a people who trust God. Acts chapter 19, I want to start with verse 23. And about that time there arose no small disturbance concerning the way. No kidding. <laughs> when you read Acts, that happens over and over again. And so Paul, in his, or rather Luke, in his delicate way, said, you know, there, what I'm getting ready to tell you, is this has happened before. No small disturbance. The gospel is subversive. It upsets the lives wherever the gospel is preached. So Luke says, just to give you a little heads up, Paul's been preaching in this city for two years a town the Spirit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit did not allow him to go into earlier, but now he's there, third mission trip, and he spent a lot of time. And after two and a half years, no small disturbance began to appear concerning the way. Verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who had made silver shrines of Artemis, a goddess, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only this, there is danger that this trade of ours would fall into disrepute. Also, that the temple of the great goddess Artemis would be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship should even be the throne from her magnificence. And before I continue with the rest of this part of the story, I just want to offer an aside. It's a little observation. Have you noticed how often people who are involved in a shady trade of making money at the expense of the fear of people by selling religious guarantees or certainties? Have you noticed how often when someone calls them out, these hucksters, these charlatans, for making a lot of money on the backs of people who have religious desires, that often when you say, you know what, I'm not sure that's of God, even though they claim to be of God. How often they immediately say, well, they're attacking God. No, we're not. We're simply questioning the legitimacy of your shady business. And that's what's happening here. Demetrius is a silversmith. He makes these little shrines, these little replicas of the temple of Artemis. The Romans called her Diana. And he and the other craftsmen sold all kinds of trinkets. We would call them souvenirs, but they saw them as, indeed, things that had great power of divine protection. And he's discovered that the gospel of Paul is kind of hurting his business. And therefore, they, they not only say, you know what? Our standard of living, our way of making a living is in jeopardy. Not only that, they're trying to attack our God, our goddess. Verse 28, when they heard this, they were filled with rage, and they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. <clears throat> and the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into a theater, this huge theater that's still standing today, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into that assembly, the disciples wouldn't let him. As a matter of fact, there were some Asiarchs who were friends of him, and said, you know, urge him, don't venture into the theater, verse 32. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not even know for what cause they had come together. And then that's the way it happens. There's a big old mob, and a bunch of people are joining it, and, and before you know it, they're all shouting something. They're, they're crying out, and what are they saying? Verse 33, <clears throat> some of the crowd thought, that it was Alexander had caused the problem. Since Jews had put him forward, and he tried to motion with his hand and, and begin to make a defense, but verse 34, when they recognized that he's a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. <laughs> Can you imagine 
A God and country rally lasting for two hours? That's what's happening here. Two hours, they're shouting, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, greatest for two hours. What's going on here? Every city believed that there was a patron god or goddess that protected them. And it was their duty to show acts of obeisance and subservience to that god or goddess. It just so happens that Ephesus, that's a little port city in in Asia Minor, were convinced that the Greek goddess Artemis was their patron protector. The myth went like this. Artemis, the daughter of Zeus, was born in this tree grove outside of the town. And that she had decided that the Ephesians would be the people that she would protect. And not only the Ephesians, it was believed that Artemis, Diana, protected all travelers. And so you could imagine, since Ephesus sat on the mouth of the Caister River that was fed by the Aegean Sea, and it was a major port city, all the ships making their way through the Mediterranean world would stop to pay their respects to Artemis, to Diana, because she was the one who would make sure that their mercantile activity, that their nautical journey would be protected. So they would come into the port, and right there at the harbor was this massive agora, a marketplace, a forum, and they would unload all the merchandise, and they could sell it right there. But before they would do anything, they would go straight to the temple of Artemis, and if you, you can even see to this day, there's this big city that leads up to the hills. There's a massive theater that you can see from where the harbor was, and above that, on the highest mountain, was this massive temple to Artemis. It was one of the ancient seven wonders of the world, huge, and the traffic going up and back to the temple was Constant. As a matter of fact, two times a year, the Ephesians would celebrate, they would have a God and country celebration, a parade, where the priests of Artemis would leave the temple and <clears throat> lead a parade through the streets of Ephesus, and the people would sing songs. Great is Artemis, our God. Well, I don't know how they sang it, but anyway, they sang, they sang patriotic songs, we would call them extolling Artemis because she was a great protector of of the citizens of Ephesus as well as travelers. She was one of the most popular gods, goddesses of the world at that time. And in their backyard, they had her temple. Not only that, sometime, and we don't know exactly when, but the city clerk makes reference to it in verse 35 when he tries to calm this mob down in the theater, some, there was a meteorite that fell from the sky. And when it came from the heavens, the, it looked like it had strange writing on it. It's kind of strange little figures. And so the priests were convinced, this is Artemis. She's giving us a message. So they took that meteorite, took it into the temple and kept it there. And the priest would copy down these little, little strange figures. It would look like probably like hieroglyphics. And they would stamp them on little pieces of pottery, and they could, you could get from them, these priests, after they blessed them with this magical formula, these amulets that they would wear around their neck, they would wear them on their belts, they would sew them in the hem of their garments. They wore these magical charms, charm bracelets, convinced that Artemis would protect devoted citizens wearing these magical charms from the evil powers that are trying to constantly trying to get you, trying to attack you. Can you imagine how many people, as risky as the world was in the first century, would stream up to the temple and they would buy one of those magical charms and put it in, in their, they would put it on their head, they would put it around their waist, put it around their feet, protecting all the major zones of the body. And not only that, these same priests would sell you a curse tablet to call upon evil powers to attack your enemy. So you could go up there and get you a good curse tablet. 
Or sometimes they'd write the curse on a piece of paper. So, boy, they had a really good business going. Go up there and get your protection. Go up there and get a curse. And back and forth, the people would traverse to Artemis. So, it just so happens that Paul comes into that world of people who lived in constant fear of evil powers out to get you and a, and a temple that was supposedly housing a goddess who gave secret formula that would serve as your life insurance, your health insurance, your protection, Paul begins to preach a gospel that basically says, Christ has set us free from these evil powers. Now, we don't know in the sermon that Paul preached there. Luke doesn't record it. But we do have Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And when you read Ephesians, you begin to hear some themes that probably sound like the kind of themes that he would have hit upon to convince the Ephesians in believing in Christ. Like in chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul says, I'm hoping the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. I hope you'll look upon the world not in such fear but with resurrection eyes. That you might know the surpassing greatness of Christ's power to those of us who believe. And indeed that God showed his strength through his son and that he raised him from the dead and seated him in heavens at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. And he seated him above all of these evil powers that oppose us. Authorities, rulers, dominions, the wicked powers of darkness, every place where their name appears, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And since God has put all these powers under Christ's feet, he defeated them through his death and resurrection. And we are his body. Therefore, Paul would preach to the Ephesians, God has put all these enemies under your feet. You don't have to live in fear anymore. Indeed, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, Paul would say to the Ephesians, and we read about it in chapter 6. We're supposed to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We put on the armor of God so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil, these rulers and wicked forces and darkness. We take upon ourselves the full armor of God so we can stand firm in our faith. We wear a helmet of salvation. We wear a loin belt of truth that protects us here. Our feet are protected by the gospel. Can you hear it? You have a breastplate of righteousness. You pick up a shield of faith to withstand the fiery darts of the devil. Because Christ has overcome them, he is indeed your divine protection. He's your security. He's your bodyguard. He's your body armor. You wear Christ as the one who protects you from all these evil forces. The Ephesians believed it. They believed the gospel of Paul. So much so that they decided they weren't going to live in fear anymore. And they decided to turn their back on that way of life that was crippling them. And they decided to take all of their magical charms, all of these curse tablets and books, and all the magical paraphernalia, and they decided to burn it in front of all the Ephesians. That's what Paul talks about in Acts chapter 19, verse 8 and following. He first goes into the synagogue and begins to preach this gospel for three months, and things are going well, but some begin to speak evil of the way in verse 9. He says, no problem, I'll just rent the school of Tyrannus, and I'll stay preach the gospel there. And all who came heard the gospel, both Jews and Greeks. Verse 11, we're told in Acts chapter 19 that God began to perform really unusual miracles through Paul. They decided, these Ephesians who believed in the gospel, that they would send to Paul these little scars, these little uh, aprons, and they would rub it on his body, and they would take those pieces of cloth back, and it would heal the people of maladies and sickness. 
And the spirits, the evil spirits would be cast out. Now, that kind of miracle didn't happen anywhere else except in Ephesus. Can you see why? God's teaching them that the crisis in Paul could be the Christ in you that will protect you. Indeed, they begin to believe. Even though Jewish exorcists, verse 13, trying to imitate Paul and casting out these evil spirits, and these evil spirits turned and attacked them because they were false prophets, Verse 17, it says, this became known to all the people, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus. Fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Verse 18, read with me now. Many of those who had believed, they kept coming, they kept confessing, and they disclosed their secret practices. They began to realize that they could not hold a faith in Jesus and try to hold on a fearful life. What'd they do? Verse 19. Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of all, and they counted up the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. If Luke is referring to a Greek drachma, a little silver coin, which represents about a day's wage, and if we were to calculate you know, $15 an hour and a day's wage. Do you know how much magical paraphernalia went up and smoke that day? Do you know how much of their fear they burned that day? Six million dollars. How fearful were the Ephesians? They thought they could buy protection for six million dollars. And they burned it all. And by the way, with my mind's eye, I can't imagine what Paul thought. He didn't tell him to do this. He didn't tell him to bring, you know, scars to him and handkerchiefs to rub on it. He didn't tell him to do any of this. But God was doing some amazing things. And when he watches these Ephesians bring all this and they burn it, I'm sure the apostle was incredibly overwhelmed. Because this simple gospel he preached that Jesus has destroyed all the enemies that oppose humanity and you can trust him because he cares for you more than you even care for yourself was good news. They were tired, hear me now, of living in the darkness of their paralyzing fear. It was time to be set free. Now, I'm not suggesting we have a book burning. I have no idea what would be, be burned. But that image is a powerful image to me of, that their fear goes up in flames that day. They're tired of living that way. I think there are a lot of people that are sick and tired of living in the slavery of their own fear. <laughs> and I thought I knew what fear was. I mean, this is a pretty, you know, Dangerous world, even though we've got so many advances from their day. We, we are still incredibly fearful of what could happen. And so I, I thought, you know, trying to negotiate the potentials, and especially for us, you know, coming out of a pandemic. It, for the longest time, I have to confess to you, I was so fearful and so anxious uh, my parents, are like I was like 16, 17, they didn't know what they were going to do for me. I thought, that was fear? You don't know what fear is until you have children. That's fear. And, you know, not only you know, trying to negotiate a really hostile world with, with toddlers or, or grade school kids, that's hard enough, Right? But I'll never forget the first time our oldest, Andrew, got in a car after getting his license, and I saw the car leave our driveway, head out into that dangerous, terrible, wicked world, and I saw the taillights going away, and my heart went, <laughs> Or when Emma was trying to launch her career, she'd finished college, Sherry's dad had just died. And so death was hanging like a curtain over our hearts. And the very next day after we had the funeral, Emma got in her car, 
went down that same driveway, headed for Chicago because she had gotten an, an internship there, Chicago. And we told her, when you get there, you know, she already got a subletted apartment, and it was near to the studio where she was going to be studying downtown Chicago. And it just so happens when she got there, and I didn't know this, but we got, found out later that they happened to have their little, you know, their, their working time from 3 to 11 at night. That's the wrong time. 3 to 11 at night. And, and, and so... Of course, what are you going to do? And she says, well, you know, I'm going to go down to the station closest to the studio, downtown Chicago, at 11 o'clock at night. And get on the, you know, the L, the L, the elevated train. And so I had her do a dry run. I mean, she came on Saturday and on Sunday said, okay, we're going to do a dry run. You're going to go, you're going to, <laughs> you're going to tell me how long does it take to walk from the studio to that station and when you, when, you, when you leave the studio, you're going to text me. And then when you get to the station, you're going to text me. And then we timed out how long it would take for her to get off the L at her station where her apartment was. And we knew how long that was supposed to last. And you're going to text me when you get off the L at that station. And she timed it. It was a 10-minute walk to her apartment. And it was about midnight, a little after midnight, when she would get off that train Chicago, midnight. Whew, I'm just getting anxious thinking about it now. And I know how the story turns out. Anyway, she, 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 we, it would take about 10 minutes. So we knew about 12, 15, right around there, we'd get a text. When you come into that apartment, you text us, okay? So first time, Monday, Monday night. Text, a little after 11, leaving the studio. Okay. Okay, it's going to take about that. 11.15, at the station. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay. Then I got a text, you know, getting off the train. It was much longer than we thought because she'd missed her, she had missed. So we were waiting, waiting, waiting. She missed her um, platform to get off, so she had to kind of backtrack, but she finally gets off there, good. We know it's going to take about 10 feet. So by now, it's like 1230, and we're waiting for her to send the text home in the apartment. No text. 1245. No text. One o'clock. No text. Now, I'd like to say at this point, I'd like to tell you that at that moment, a pious desire to fall on our knees and pray, and we had a sweet hour of prayer. That's, that's not what happened. We had about an hour of torturous agony because we're thinking, oh, my goodness, we don't even know the names of the girls where she's supposed to be. We don't know their phone number. We have no way of getting in contact with her. So Cherry said, you need to call. Cause I, you need, you know, so I start calling, no answer. One o'clock, no answer. Call again, 110, no answer. 111, call again, no answer. Call, 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 no answer, no answer, no answer. And at this point, you'll hear a difference between Cherry and me. Mom is looking for flights to Chicago. I decide I'm going to start calling local hospitals and even transferring me to the morgue. Do you have a Jane Doe? Cherry couldn't listen. She goes, I got to get out of here. It was a deep fear that paralyzed us. And finally, at 1.30, I call and she picks up. She goes, oh, Dad, I'm sorry. He goes, oh, oh okay, okay, yeah, all right. What happened? Well, it was been a long day, and I was so hungry, and so I, I, I cooked something to eat, and then I jumped in the shower, and I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. No, you won't. You will never do that again. <laughs> Turned out the lights, went to bed, and I did not sleep. Lying there in the darkness of my fear, I prayed to God, and I said, I've been here so many times. I'm sorry. I don't trust you. 
Fear just cripples me. I go to dark places in a hurry. Can't do this anymore. Here I am again. Can't do this anymore. Oh, God, help me to trust in you, believing that your son should already prove to me that you care more for my children than I do. You are their father. You are their God. You've already proven over and over again that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You've already proven it so many times. So once again, I will tell you, I'm sorry. I don't want to live in fear and slavery of that anxiety. That I will cast all my care upon you because you care for me. And that's why I hate the expression when people who face that horrible disease, cancer, and they die. People say, well, she lost her battle with cancer. No, she didn't. She didn't lose it because death is not the end for Christians. She would only have lost it if she lost hope, if she lost her faith. And the enemy, I know, is trying to beat it out of us. That's why I love to watch Christians like these Ephesians who will decide they're going to burn up their faith in the middle of everyone and say, we will not live that way anymore. God is on our side. Jesus proves it to us. There is no weapon formed against us that will defeat us. And therefore, we will choose to be full of faith and not full of fear. And that's good news. Let's pray. Father, help us. We claim to be a people of faith. We're constantly being reminded there are people that make a lot of money trading on our fear. But help us to stand firm in our faith, resisting the enemy, knowing that we are dressed in the armor of Christ himself. No weapon formed against us will defeat us. We have been set free from our worst fears because of all that Christ has done today and forevermore. We trust him. God, I promise you, we trust you until the end day, to the last day. Help us to be found faithful in the meantime. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? Let's sing a song of response. I'll be at the front to receive any who need to make a public decision like following Christ. You may want to join our church. You can do that by walking the aisle. You can just contact us, and we'll receive you that way as well. Whatever decision you make public, I pray you make it as we sing. Speak to me. You're the only voice I want to hear. You're not.
thank you guys for being in our time of worship today. I know uh, it's a special time to be able to gather together. I just want to make you aware of uh, to next week. It's Labor Day Sunday, and we're going to have Sunday school at 945, and then we're going to have our 11 o'clock worship. We're just not going to have our early service ne- next week. I want you to be aware of that, and we'll have a few other folks here. And uh, just as I want to close, as we close out here, I kind of at different points remind you that we do have offering boxes here at our exits. We've got one up here as well. Several of you give through the offering boxes. Some of you give online through our Realm app. And a lot of you have set up through your bill pay. And you, you want to do it through your bank and everything. And we appreciate that. That would be a challenge. If you've not given anything to the church this year, would you consider giving something? And if you've given something every so often... Would you consider giving consistently? And if you give consistently, would you be like some of the few that will give a percentage of their income? So we trust that the Lord's going to take care of the church as well as we trust that the Lord is going to take care of you. May the Lord guide you and bless you today. Thank you. Have a great Sunday.